200 million people within the Indian subcontinent, which makes uh, one in 20 worldwide to be those who are from an untouchable Dalit low caste community. So that's a huge problem. Uh, some of you might know about caste, but my own colleagues at UCL um, who have had PhDs in social sciences and history and psychology have not known much about it. And um, some of them even pronounce it as gaste. That um, part of my presentation has to be to give you a historical context. In a way, it's a finding by itself, but it's important that I do that. And my apologies for those of you if I come across as patronizing, and if you already know what I'm going to be sharing, but it's important that I do share, and that context will then hopefully shape the text that may or may not come today, but we have two more days, so we can perhaps <laughs> go into the more intensive findings of the ethnography that we did. My own work is on uh, the relationship between marginality and mental health across cultures. My field sites are in uh, Assam, India, where I'm working on the mental health implications of human elephant conflict because the elephants have started tasting rice wine. They drink 60 liters at a time and they smash 30 houses, leaving at least 20 widows time three children with hardly any understanding by the local mental health professionals about the nature of the toxic landscape that is being generated and a complete alienation. My second field site is in New Delhi, where we just started a year-long ethnography of a making of an Indian psychiatrist to find out what is it that happens to them by the time they finish that makes them so alien to their local culture. Uh, is it the text that we export from here? Or is it the teachers who teach them? Or is it their social class? Well, we want to do that because we don't have that. And unless we do that, we don't have our own histories and our own understanding and the reflexivity that mental health professionals. A third site is in Gujarat, which is a state where the recent Prime Minister of India has been elected. Uh, Navyana is the only caste-based publisher in India. Uh, this is an extract from uh, their first uh, uh, website, which they put up. Uh, my colleagues in Europe told me that when you go to Canada, because there are many Jewish people there, don't even use the word Holocaust, because to bring anything closer to the Holocaust is going to be upsetting to them, because that is a prime example of uh, violence that took place at a level that cannot be paralleled. Uh, and so I changed the topic. And I didn't want to call it Holocaust, but I thought I would have this paragraph because this is a continuing genocide that is taking place, uh, and yet uh, very little that is being done uh, to address um, and to bring about a change. Just for those of you who might not know, the Hindu caste system is based upon uh, um, a notion of hierarchy, which is governed by ideas of purity and pollution. Um, there are the four caste systems, and there is uh, the caste system actually is a bit complicated. I can't explain all of it to you here in one. I'll need a seminar because it's about jatis as well as uh, varnas. The varna system predates the jati systems. The jatis are locally shaped by the ecologies and their communities. The caste system is much more broader as an umbrella term. Now, outside of this caste system uh, are people who are the untouchables or the Dalits, uh, who are not uh, part of the official caste system on account of their impurity, but as you know that they hold up the entire structure because the moment you remove these lower castes, then you have a situation where the hierarchy starts getting flatter. Uh, I need to declare my own position. I come from an untouchable caste background. My parents were cobblers, and uh, that might help you appreciate uh, if uh, I have a certain take or view uh, and my own prejudices about uh, uh, what is going on. Um, this is just some very few statistics very quickly. These have changed now. Uh, this was two years ago, but things are getting even worse and worse. Um, the problem is not so much about uh, this happening, but it's the governance that is an issue here. The governance is an issue because uh, India is run by um, two constitutions a legal constitution and a cultural constitution. Um, but there are issues which have an implication for health professionals, including mental health professionals. Mental health professionals haven't examined this issue till to date. There is a 
it's a, it's a hugely sensitive topic to discuss because as soon as the issue of caste is mentioned in higher education, the associations are with positive discrimination, with lacking in merit, with getting in at the price of someone else who has worked very hard and got twice as many marks. So in some ways, um, the discourse is around uh, uh, a, a short period of history and not looking at uh, how this is, can be situated uh, within a more uh, wider context, both temporally and uh, historic, uh, 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 spatially. So um, the issues around is, the issue, I mean, these are just some of the bullet points that I want to go through to tell you that these are the issues where there's a problem of uh, literacy, of access to water, of uh, nutrition. So one of my field sites is in the state of Gujarat. My colleagues uh, who have now finished the study, we placed uh, four ethnographers in four villages which were sampled by tribe, religion and social class to look at why the preschool supplementary uh, nutritional program wasn't working, despite the fact that Gujarat as a state has poured in um, the most, uh, the maximum amount of money to run this program with the aid of the World Bank. It's legislated, it runs in all the countries, but the uptake rate is only 20% in the state of Gujarat. And the question was, well, how come this uptake rate is low? So that's uh, a study we just finished. Again, I won't have time to share the findings because they are fascinating and they're disturbing. And I want to now show you uh, a brief clip. I begin first with an idea of these issues of caste discrimination and stigma. How do they begin and where do they start? We can't just go on to the religious texts and scriptures and say, that's where it is. We can't look at institutions alone. But I want to show you a clip around how children get socialized into ideas about pollution and purity. And it's very telling to actually um, see this short clip. So these are children in a village in Gujarat who are trying to approach a hut of a Dalit woman. And you can see touch is not an issue at the moment here. And the name? Yeah. I saw the name by the name. Yeah, yeah, no. The Mandar came with you. I got a boss. A massive lunch. Massive lunch. Yeah, yeah. Why you on the hill? You can watch the film, the full film on YouTube if you haven't. Okay, now we shift to the Prime Minister's base where he's been elected from and the Chief Scholar uh, who speaks about his views on uh, the caste system and uh, the reason why it needs to continue. So this is the view of uh, the holy city of Banaras, uh, 
lots of prayers, uh, devout Hindus who worship, um, hermits who are called sadhus who live there. It's considered to be a place where you can get purified if you take a holy dip in the Ganges, which is the Ganges River there. He's never been arrested or indicted on any other charges. Now that's how he shifts his agency. So he's looking through the eyes darkly. Uh, but uh, now um, it is uh, this particular project was actually carried out where the NGO uh, in connection moved uh, uh, to different parts of the country to show what is uh, really taking place. This is again a short clip, which is in Gujarat again. This is the food van. Now we shift to the south of India. And you notice the person taking out of his slippers. Because that's a requirement for anyone who is a Dalit untouchable. <laughs> Now we move to another state which is Andhra Pradesh, which is mid central India. <laughs> That's in Bihar state now. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
उसको ला रहता है पूरी पड़ता है जो रहता है तो बेचा पड़ता है पानी पड़ता साफ छटता है साफ कपड़ा लगता है उसका बाता जो होता है उसको नहाना धोना आपात से सौ बजे उसको सेक भी देखा तेल लगाता है कितना बजे तेल उनके यहाँ पे काम करने जाते हैं तो वहाँ पे पानी मिलता है आपको There is the sweeper community. Most municipal corporations run by the government legitimize this profession of manual scavengers for people from the Dalit community. This is one community who deals with dead bodies and they are also untouchables. That's the last bit to tell you that this practice is uh, ancient, it's difficult to resist, it's humiliating, it takes away the dignity of people and turns them into non-humans. The criticism for this particular short flick is that uh, the people themselves are involved in uh, co-opting and colluding with this particular practice. Dalit protest in Yogi is the traditional practice for over 400 years at Bukki Subramanian Temple, one of Karnataka's famous religious destinations. Dalit and backward class people follow this deeply humiliating tradition by Madhya Snana, rolling on plantain leaves on which the Brahmins have eaten their fruit. The belief is that this would cure kid ailments of the Dalit. This is pollution in the reverse. This is a disgrace to the civil society. Everyone should be ashamed about this. The government should do something to stop it. The temple officials claim that the tradition is not forced upon anyone. India ke under India. This is not by force. This is just belief in tradition. It's not only that Dalits do it. This is a temple full of tradition and we don't force anyone. 
But it's exactly this explanation that helps the civil society stand up against the practice. It's very ugly to uh, stop this uh, stone practice. The Kukhi Subramanian Temple is one of the most revered temples in the state and has Chief Minister B.S. Yadirapha. I think he's been re-elected. But the question is, why do such traditions remain when society is always changing? With Abbas and Deepa Balakrishnan in... The person who resisted that, uh, you can see what happened to him over there. He got beaten up the next day. Now, the question was, you know, what is, why is this subject important of an interest? And I think one of the issues I can broadly say that the local is continuously being ignored in favor of the global. And that's happening now at a, at a very rampant pace within India's mental health care system. Um, what has been done so far to look at the mental health dimensions, the stigma, the humiliation, the psychological language? Nothing. There is no literature. There is nothing. The first one that was done by myself was the only one that we held. That was in 2002. We didn't have money or a grant. And what are the future directions? Now, I think the problem here is a quote stated by Ambedkar who talked about when he returned with a PhD and a DSC from Columbia and from uh, LSC, he had difficulty at that time even finding himself uh, a room to stay. And this is from his uh, writings on waiting for a visa. Uh, we have two texts and that's one of the problems. We have uh, a cultural text that runs and is very uh, historically rooted, uh, dates back to the BC. And we have a constitution which is more recent. And the incongruency between the two is still a matter of debate and a problem that hasn't been resolved. There has been resistance. There is a, there was a well known poet who unfortunately died last year who worked um, as a teenage taxi driver, lived amongst pimps, prostitutes drug peddlers, and he founded the Dalit Panther movement, which was modeled on the Black Panther movement. Um, one of his famous poems in this book, which is translated now uh, into English, uh, is about being a venereal soul in the private part of language. The other forms of resistance are Dalit intellectuals who have borrowed from the tradition of Lord Macaulay, who some of you may have known, had talked about how uh, the Indians needed to be civilized and anglicized and that was the only way forward. So they have put together a new symbol which talks about the English goddess and the road out for people who are in this situation was English and IT. So that's another form of resistance. The thirds are groups, a uh, gentleman here who's a founder of a particular movement called the Dalit Avataris. He has two men there with a bodyguard and a rifle because they are constantly attacked by the upper caste people. This is the Uttar Pradesh. He was a manual scavenger, then changed into a Reverend Phillips, and now he has changed his name to Guruji. So you can see his gradual ascendancy. Uh, this is the school uh, which is, he runs, and the children with their own imagination have named uh, each class with what they aspire to want to be. This is using their kitchen tongs as a musical instrument singing songs of liberation when I visited them last. I told them the difficulties of getting a grant to want to study, to understand. And their response was, you don't worry, we'll keep a diary. We'll keep a diary and we have so many of us that we'll give you our diaries. Uh, so this is something that I hope that at some stage we will do. The existing literature is quite dated. There's hardly been any work. It's mainly theologians. The most important person is Webster, who has advocated for conversion to Christianity as perhaps the only way of liberation from the stigma of untouchability and restoration of dignity. Um, a lot of people talk in everyday um, life around their wounded psyches, around their pride, a sense of inferiority that carries right through into university and into jobs. And that has had a tremendous impact in this subpowering and taking away the agency of people who have worked very hard and aspired to reach positions and power. And this new identity development and the strategies that have uh, been used uh, by various Dalits have appropriated various existing movements. 
I won't go into it, but just to briefly tell you that there is a whole uh, notion that conversion to Christianity is perhaps one of the best ways to heal the wounded psyche because there seem to be no other way. What we did in our study, because I'm reaching the end of it and Lawrence is soon going to be asking me to get off the place, is that, you know, we, we decided that we'll look at uh, Dalits in a slum area of uh, Maharashtra state uh, called Ambedkar Nagar, and we'll look at a group of Dalits who have converted to Buddhism. I will try to see what happens to ideas of theodicy. Does their inner psychological world change? Does their stigma change? Does their sense of psychological self-esteem shift? That was a study that was funded by the British Academy for just a mere £5,000, which hardly did much, but those were the objectives. Uh, I'll skip this, uh, these slides because I'll just come straight to the findings and tell you what happened as a result of that. Um, the one thing I want to sh very quickly say is that uh, within mental health, if we approach this whole issue about uh, uh, Dalits being victims of trauma, we have a serious problem which my colleagues in uh, India have warned me to stop studying Dalits. Uh, because they have been already in a state of being stigmatized and to look at their psychological problems is going to further pathologize them. So the question is, can we study the perpetrators, the institutions, the communities, the individuals? Are they people who have a skewed identity development? Do they have an inflated sense of self-worth, esteem or pride? Is there a desire to dominate? But doing an ethnography of upper caste is not easy. Like doing an ethnography of elites is difficult. Access itself is a problem. And I'm still caught up in trying to figure out how this might be possible. But the problem here is that caste is co-constituted and it may be politically incorrect, but it is important to say that you need both the perpetrator and the humiliated to form that diet. And here, my worry is what has happened in Canada, for example. Uh, we've had a situation where about two, three years ago, a book was released uh, which called um, uh, for a new syndrome called the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Uh, there is a very likely chance that in order to gain legitimacy and in order to get PTSD, which many immigrants want for their visas and for their benefits, there's a very good chance that when this goes further, there is a risk that they might end up with a post-traumatic Dalit syndrome because the perpetrator is obviously left out. Of course, uh, Joy has been running courses, she has a website, uh, she runs uh, a study guide, she calls it PTSS, uh, she's a social worker. That's Ambedkar who was a pioneer of it, but uh, these humiliations continue, women being parad paraded naked. The caste is not just rele relegated to humans, it crosses non-humans. So there's a dog who became a Dalit because a Dalit woman fed a hungry dog with some bread and the dog was casted out and the woman had to pay a fine in the village. Uh, for having done what she did. Um, the study site was uh, a dump, a gar literally a garbage dump in the center of Pune. That is overlooking from the Google right here at the center there, uh, where you could see. The entrance to the place itself is full of garbage and in a way it uh, concretizes the symbolic notion of pollution. Um, so this is what we did. We looked at uh, uh, these three questions. We did focus groups, we placed an ethnographer within the community, the slum, and we also tried to see whether uh, the um, Brahmin community, control for social class and gender, had a particular attitude that may or may not be stigmatizing toward Dalits by developing an ethnographically derived vignette. That failed miserably because none of the Brahmins refused, uh, allowed us to have allow access to their homes or to even fill up the questionnaire. The response was, this is a dated problem. This no longer exists. So there was a frank denial. We couldn't develop, therefore, the, um, the, um, the findings from the third objective. One thing that struck us was that there was nothing called conversion. People used the church and the Buddhist Vihara in an instrumental fashion. They went to the church because they felt good. They came back, they felt they were posh. They could speak in a posh style. They saw the Christmas uh, shows, the children wearing white, the music, the lightness, but uh, also the pastor who has turned it into a way that is culturally blended. So he has, he uses uh, 
local Indian musical instruments, and it's the back of a missionary hospital. So there's a close link between suffering and healing that takes place. Uh, when I went to visit the pastor and had a chat with him, and he said, you're doing great work, but he said, Ambedkar uh, was actually inspired by Jesus. And it is Jesus speaking through him. So it's an effort to also Christianize Ambedkar. Here what I want you to notice is, the, those who converted to Buddhism have established now a new lineage, where there's an erasure of memory of their traumas in the past, and a direct connection with Buddha. So many of our informants said that they were originally Buddhists and they actually are not untouchables. But these are myths of origins that people have talked about, but there is also a vertical lineage that is being established uh, on the other end. Uh, the group who converted found themselves uh, to be less stigmatized because it was a route into political activism. It was easier to handle disclosure because there was no problem. They had a, retained a certain amount of dignity. They were articulate, they were assertive. Uh, the group which didn't convert were helpless, they felt they had no social capital, there was nowhere to go, there was no future for them, both men and women. The men looked more, appeared more depressed, more helpless. The women, however, seemed to have a certain degree of hope and held out hope. This is just a short form of the findings because they are uploaded on the website, so I hope you'll get to see them. I went back to disseminate the study findings in the slum. I thought no one would come because there's no place in that slum. I mean, there are tin boxes everywhere around. But 150 people turned up and young girls and boys from colleges said we want something that will make us self-assertive so that we don't get stigmatized in schools and colleges. Can you do something for us to help us with this humiliation because this is coming in our way. Uh, if there is a way in which you can provide us with cultural etiquettes perhaps, perhaps a way in which we can articulate and be able to be assertive, we would want something of that kind happening. And this is the next stage where I think I would want to proceed. So the impacts of this, there have been some positive impacts. Uh, people say that now, you know, the upper caste rely upon us as working maids, but there were a huge, a huge number of people who talked about kamipana, which is a Marathi word for feeling less or being of a lesser human status. Um, and it was, it's hard to differentiate in a single pilot study the findings that suggest, but there's a shift uh, that has taken place when people convert to Buddhism. I'm not arguing that Buddhism uh, is uh, the solution to it because it doesn't, they don't become Buddhist, there's an incrementality. So it's not an absolute conversion. The word Dalit is attached as a prefix, so you're Dalit Buddhists or you're Dalit Christians. So you continue with your caste and there's a saying that you can leave your caste, but caste won't leave you. And that is a question that uh, is also within uh, the Muslim population uh, who have a Dalit uh, Meaning. So the, the last part where we failed is uh, just to tell you that we went to the Brahmin locality and we found that they were inaccessible. Um, they um, just gave us 10%, 10 forms after knocking on 100 houses. Uh, the co-PI, who was from a Brahmin background, had to accompany the field researcher who was a Dalit for enhancing access and a fear of a backlash. Um, and after covering 250 households, we only got 20 forms. Many families refused, they said it was not modern anymore to do such studies. And the experience was humiliating to the Dalit researchers, so we had to have a lot of debriefing over Skypes because it was e difficult for me to go over. But we hope that now with the way things have been happening with rape cases and humiliations across the country, uh, many universities are keen to set up cultural consultation services for students and staff who suffer from various kinds of discriminations. Uh, and uh, the problems that might be um, the, you know, um, difficult to struggle with. I want to end with to say that there is uh, a need for a combined anthropological and psychiatric uh, approach. Um, I think we need to forge links, uh, but we need to forge links with mental health professionals because that self-reflexivity is still missing. It's hard, extremely hard to broach the topic of caste. It's not in the textbooks. It's not discussed as part of how it contributes to mental suffering. It's seen as something which in a secular country, one shouldn't be having to talk or discuss. And it's also, I think, in a way to demonstrate that the local, the global, as we call it, the global mental health movement, the global actually is just a collection of locals. And if you don't look at the locals and the particularities, global doesn't make any sense. 
For those of you who want to see a broader picture of the findings and some of the theoretical issues that emerge, there is a PDF version of this which is also uploaded on the slide. Thank you very much, Lawrence, and sorry I have entered the time.